Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome from the maternal OCD team. My name is Maria Babetta, and I'll shortly um, be introducing Dr. Fiona Chalakoum and Diana Wilson. Um, appreciate the intro, Kath and Diana, and I um, do wear Maternal Mental Health Alliance hats, but for today, we're wearing our maternal OCD hats. Um, and we just want to firstly thank you for choosing the session. So yes, we will be covering what perinatal OCD is and also um, have a Q&A session. And just wanted to assure you that although your questions will be asked, only the four of us that you can see on the um, screen now and any moderators that are working their magic behind the screen will see that. So they'll be anonymized. Um, and also to acknowledge, I know the pandemic means we can't be part of a conference um, at this point face to face. Um, but there are benefits. So if you do feel unsettled, hearing anything that we're talking about, or you see anything, you can simply turn your volume off. You could leave the room that you're in and you won't be missing out because after the conference, once the dust has settled, this session will be live on the um, Action website. So you won't be able, you, know, you can go back in and listen to it. So enough from me. I will now hand over to Dr. Fiona Chalakoum just for a short summary of who you are, Fiona, and a quick mini summary of your work. Thank you, Maria. Um, I am Fiona Chalakoum. Um, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I've been lucky enough to be working in the area of perinatal OCD for some time. Um, I'm very lucky to know you guys for really the same amount of time. So. Uh, I have done a clinical trial in the area um, and I've been yeah, very fortunate to have met many women with perinatal OCD uh, and uh, each person I meet with it is, uh, helps me learn something more new about it, but it is, yeah, it's been a great experience. Lovely, thank you ever so much Fiona and then over to you Diana just to quick mini intro of who you are. Thank you Maria, uh, I'm Diana and I'm originally from the Hawke's Bay in New Zealand I'm co-founder of Maternal OCD. I'm married to Rob and I'm the mother of four children who were brought up from an early age knowing that their mum had had and had recovered from OCD. I would just like to add that you don't need to tell anyone that you have OCD. There's just one person who needs to know and that's your therapist. So I had OCD from the age of eight to 35 years and I was undiagnosed for 26 years. I was introduced to cognitive behavioural therapy 20 years ago and have since been about 99% recovered. At times, therapy was challenging, but it was also an amazing experience. I also took an SSRI. Before having children, I spent time working at a nursery school in London and also enjoyed backpacking in various parts of the world. After my recovery from OCD, I began giving peer support to adults with the disorder. Since setting up maternal OCD with Maria, I have supported women with perinatal OCD and some dads too. Having done this for about 15 years, I'm now taking time out from peer support. This ranged from one-to-one, -one, online and telephone peer support to also facilitating local support groups in East Sussex at the Priory and other group meetings in Kent and London. Please do find a local support group. It can be a very good place to start. Raising awareness in the healthcare profession is important to maternal OCD, and many hours have been spent giving talks in GP surgeries to mid midwifery and psychology students, and to those at IACs and MBUs, and this will continue. And I look forward to sharing the session with you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, um, Diana. So a quick intro from me. You know my name is Maria and I'm co-founder to Maternal OCD with Diana Wilson. Um, I'm married to Tom and we parent two children. And I never thought I'd have a mental health, um, let alone during motherhood. Um, I had all sorts of plans to embrace life and actually life took a very different turn. Um, now I've experienced perinatal OCD three times because one was post uh, and I look back and can see that I had OCD in my childhood and in my early 20s. But I didn't know. I genuinely thought other people checked, cleaned and thought the way I did. And it was after the birth of my second child um, that I was eligible for the research trial that um, Fiona has just mentioned and, and she was the lead on. 
And, um, well, you know, Fiona, my family and I are eternally grateful to you and to the therapists on the trial um, as I recovered and I was taught how to maintain recovery. And it was from that trial that maternal OCD was born. And we're always looking for ways of raising awareness of perinatal OCD, whether that's with mothers and families, whether that's with clinicians, commissions, decision, commissioners, decision makers. Basically, it's anyone that will listen who will be able to ensure that there are services available to support recovery. So what I'm going to do is screen share now and hand over to Fiona to provide us with a clinical perspective of perinatal OCD. Thank you, Rosa. That's me. So I'm just going to give you a, a quick update. Um, but yes, amazing to think how far it's come. And I think you know, maternal ACD uh, as an organisation has been so influential uh, in raising the awareness. Um, when we started the trial, I can still remember people looking at me very quizzically uh, when I mentioned this concept of perinatal ACD. People just hadn't heard of it. And of course, how could we expect women? and men themselves to have any idea about what was going on in the professionals were really drawing a blank. Um, let's just go on to the next slide. So perinatal OCD is, of course, OCD that occurs in the perinatal period. We don't have a particular uh, specifier in the diagnostics. Of course, there are many special things about the perinatal period and all that entails, but it is really uh, it's OCD in a very recognisable form, and of course we know loads about OCD and, and how it works, and, and the, we have very good treatments for it. Um, let's go on to the, the next slide, please. And in terms of the sort of particular content, so uh, there are some themes that emerge within perinatal OCD. So quite often contamination concerns, uh, particularly during pregnancy are very uh, common and that's kind of makes sense when we're all bombarded uh, during that time with all sorts of messages about contamination and cleanliness and so on. So it kind of makes sense that a certain proportion of people might, might be particularly affected by those concerns um, then. Um, and we think as far as we can tell that uh, postnatal onset seems to be more associated with the horrible intrusive thoughts of deliberate harm. So those are very sort of general patterns, but OCD can really be about a whole myriad of, of things. It, it goes with whatever material it can get. Um, so quite often people have had OCD about other things and it just kind of refocuses uh, on stuff to do with uh, pregnancy, the infant, caregiving, um, but not always. So don't worry if you don't recognise your form of OCD in the literature. OCD will love that. It will say, oh, yes, of course, there is this thing that's OCD, but oh, your one, maybe that's not the one. So I have met so many women with all sorts of different types of OCD, and there's always an individual aspect to it. So really don't worry if you don't find the exact sort of template for, for what you're experiencing. These are, these are themes, and you are a unique individual, and that's really okay, because OCD is very much about the thinking style and the processes. Um, on to the next slide, please. So uh, there are certain myths, I think, around about um, OCD and, and how common it might be. Uh, as I say, from those quizzical looks, people seemed not to have heard of it uh, at, uh, when we sort of started out in this area. Um, in the general population, OCD affects sort of between one to two percent of people. But as we've gone on to sort of thinking about perinatal OCD, it really does seem to be it affects quite a lot of women. So uh, a wonderful colleague of mine in Canada, um, who we all work with, Nicole Fairbrother, has done some really exciting research just published um, about prevalence of perinatal OCD. And what they did in this study is they asked women the sort of the standard diagnostic stuff, but they were really careful to ask women about specific... Oh, just go back to, it has a mind of its own um, about specific uh, perinatal um, infant related thoughts um, and this study showed a really much higher prevalence than we than we thought which I think probably really does fit the clinical picture so on average about seven percent of women at some point during 
um, the postpartum um, had experienced some form of, of significant um, OCD experiences. And that's not to say that this persisted in all of those women, but it does seem to be something that's really quite particular about the perinatal period that can really kind of exacerbate symptoms um, for many. I'm just going to the next slide, please. There's lots of uh, information on this slide, um, and it's not a, an exhaustive list, but here, here's some of my ideas really, and obviously based on the literature too about what why this might be a particularly sort of vulnerable time. Obviously loads going on physically, biologically, sleep-wise, all the things which really do impact on our well-being and health and um, all sorts of things. Um, Thoughts regarding um, intrusive thoughts regarding harm are really common. And there's again, Nicole Fairbrother and others have done some really important research showing that intrusive thoughts are normal. Can't put it any more plainly than that. And they're really common in new parents, um, as in parents with small babies and women and men. Um, and if we don't know that, and it's not the sort of thing that can necessarily come up in the old NCT groups and, and so on. But if you don't know that, you might be quite taken aback if you suddenly get a thought, as I did, uh, when I took, took my baby home, I had an intrusive image of kind of harming them and, you know, harming them in the bathroom. And I knew a lot about OCD at that point, and it didn't stop me from getting these thoughts. They really are normal. But if I hadn't had that background, I might have been quite surprised um, and worried about what they meant. So there's lots of other um, things that might be going on. We're kind of aware of uh, of how we're feeling. We're kind of aware of threat. Obviously, we're looking after small, vulnerable, special people at this point. Um, we might kind of have other experiences of miscarriage or loss that we that might stick with us, thinking perhaps we did something wrong, um, that kind of then taking into another pregnancy can make people more worried. Medication and all the sort of um, complicated issues about whether how people feel about taking medication can play a role. Sometimes people are, are advised to suddenly stop taking medication and obviously that, that can have an impact. Um, but as uh, Maria, Maria was saying, and you know, uh, Diana, these people might have a, a long history of OCD, but perhaps not have labeled it as such, and it might sort of um, become more prominent at this time. And obviously, special for now, there's all the other stuff that goes on, COVID and all the other pressures, uh, societal pressures and things that, in, that, that we're under at, at the moment, which I think is, of course, having an impact on, on all of us. Next slide, please. So in terms of what's here, this is uh, in England, because um, it mentions the IAP services, uh, we might present them, you know, might ask for help at, at lots of different points. So um, midwives should be screening um, for our, our mental health during pregnancy, um, but they are uh, often very good points of reference to, um, and we have specialist mental health midwives um, who can really help and refer on during pregnancy if we approach at that time. IAPT has a special per perinatal specialist working and lots of women with OCD will go to IAPT for treatment. Um, and of course, further uh, up in terms of intensity, there'd be sort of high intensity treatments, um, specialist perinatal mental health services, and even mother and baby units where, um, depending on the severity, we might, um, women with OCD might um, have treatment. So that's sort of treatment configuration at the moment. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of what you can do, if you're looking for help and looking for support, um, you can go to your GP. Um, that's obviously helpful as a point of reference. They will, can help with medication, can help you with signposting and, and midwives too. We should say sometimes professionals don't know all about OCD. Um, we um, co-produced a, a practice paper um, for uh, GPs and other professionals to help kind of identify and uh, work with women who are presenting with um, intrusive thoughts last year, but there's still lots of education to be done. Um, so you might be offered a referral to primary care, psychological therapies, but you can also self-refer um, to IAP services if you're in England. So you can just go and Google your local IAP service and your GP doesn't even have to know. Um, you can get help directly. But I think something else that's really important to do if you think you have um, OCD is just find out as much as you can about it. So kind of 
I would sort of call it like knowing your enemy. So the more you understand about OCD, how it works, how it works in other people, the, the, the better are equipped you will be to deal with um, your own OCD. So the Maternal OCD website has fantastic resources, stories of hope um, and encouragement, lots of research resources and so on. Peer support, talking to others, I think is just hugely helpful. Self-help books, other books are available, but that's one that you could try. Um, but just really understanding how OCD works, because I say it loves to kind of pretend it's something else. It loves to make it you think that you haven't got OCD. And those are its standard tricks, I think. So the more that you understand it, the better. Next. And uh, a really important uh, message, I think, to, to take home is that we do have treatments that work really well for OCD. Uh, this is the uh, just a summary from the trial. So really, this was quite a fairly short intervention, just 12 hours of treatment um, for the women in the trial. And really, most people got significantly better. Um, and we have, you know, in our clinical practice, we can offer usually a, a bit more treatment than that as well. But with that, a standard course of CBT, um, it worked really well for people. Next slide, please. So yes, the key things I wanted you to take away if you're suffering from this problem, you're certainly not alone. There are many mums and dads who are experiencing something very similar. Um, getting kind of help at an early stage or even at a later stage can be really effective. And sometimes, um, you know, when you're in the early postnatal stage, it's really difficult to, to do treatment. So don't worry if that's the case, uh, you know, just wait till things settle down and get treatment at the, at the next point that's going to suit you. So um, there's, there's, it's never, there's never an end point. Um, and as said, you know, we do have treatments that work really well. We do have evidence that it works. So hang in there with your, for your treatment. Um, if it hasn't worked for you at one time, don't worry, all therapists are different. You can give it another go. That's, that's absolutely fine. That's quite normal, um, but keep going with it. That's all that Lovely. Thank you, Fiona. And it's um, really important that we hear about it from that clinical perspective and you've broken it down really well. So, so an enormous thank you. So what I'm going to do now, um, so we have a very clear partnership, is hand over to Diana, who's going to talk about, um, from a service user perspective, what it means to have perinatal OCD. So we have both clinical and uh, personal experience. So Diana, over to you. I will ask you to unmute yourself. And then, there we go. And the floor's yours. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So what did it mean to experience perinatal OCD? It meant I was terrified from intrusive thoughts about stabbing and strangling my children or harming them with sharp objects. It meant having thoughts about accidentally overdosing my children with cowpole or antibiotics because the OCD would play tricks on my mind, making me question the times when the next dose was due. It meant I was terrified from the sickening images in my head of my babies drowning and leaving me feeling as if I was responsible. Each day I could experience up to 10 to 15 different obsessional things. Sometimes they would come one after another or out of the blue, always leaving me to question what sort of person I was. So what did these thoughts mean to me? I thought I was on a par with Myra Hindley or someone like Fred West. Pre-treatment, I wish I had had the knowledge that perinatal OCD mums don't harm their babies, and that they work away from harm and not towards it. And this is the reason why we bring in compulsions. I would have done anything to protect my dear girls from harm coming to them. I doubt serial killers would have given this a second thought. Trying to cope with this in excruciating silence meant that because I had had OCD undiagnosed for 26 years, along with four small children, age six and under, I became suicidal and I collapsed. I made a decision to ask for help because I couldn't see a way out. I felt that I was being robbed of a life I wanted to live, which was to love and care for my children 
without being terrorised by the incoming thoughts. I was done. It had finally beaten me. I wish I had had the knowledge from the onset that worldwide there had never been a case of a mother or a father with OCD acting upon their thoughts. Having perinatal OCD also meant that I was exhausted from constantly trying to keep my children safe. So what did it mean to experience CBT for perinatal OCD? I entered therapy feeling fragile, deeply depressed, and I'd lost the ability to sleep. I was fearful of disclosing any thoughts because of social services intervention. I only needed five sessions of CBT over a period of three months to recover, but most people will need more sessions than this. Trust was key with my psychiatrist, and this trust strengthened me to feel safe, and a confidence was placed to give me the freedom to talk. Choose carefully who you disclose your thoughts to. It may be the case that your GP or health visitor or midwife is not the right person to discuss your OCD with. Sometimes it can be more helpful to wait until you are with a CBT therapist where you might feel more comfortable discussing your intrusive thoughts. I responded well to treatment and in my experience, I was better suited to behavioural therapy and I focused more on this than the cognitive work. This was the right approach for me. I also took an SSRI and continue to take one today for low mood. So what did it mean to discover the power of reality testing? Well, this was a light bulb moment for me. And I realised that not pushing the thoughts away, but instead encourage them to be there and ask them to come back again and again, seem to make the thoughts give away. Having asked the thoughts to return, I would also try to mock them and just try to make them seem as ridiculous as possible. The balance of power had changed and it felt so good. I was now in charge of whether or not to engage in compulsions. So how did I distinguish between an OCD thought and something that was genuinely putting my children in danger? My own experience meant that if any unwanted thought felt magnetic, as if it was drawing me in or pulling me back into the same repetitive behaviours which were the compulsions, I would usually put it down to OCD and say out loud, walk away. This wasn't easy to do. And at times, I felt as if I was taking huge risks but it is possible to recognise what an OCD thought is with the help and support from a good CBT therapist. Pre-treatment, I kept my OCD hidden from everyone, not even my family in New Zealand knew, nor my friends. Even with the tiredness of OCD, which would bring me to my knees and make me feel physically weak and me mentally defeated, I was still able to remain sociable and build strong friendships, which I'm thankful for. It can be upsetting speaking to loved ones or friends who choose not to listen to you sincerely or show little interest in learning about the disorder. Again, choose wisely who you talk to. I just want to finish by saying that OCD is a treatable anxiety disorder, and I hope you can find the right professional to open up to, on a good day that will be tough, and on a bad day that will feel torturous. You're going through so much, so try to be with people who are kind and compassionate, and I wish you well. Thank you, Maria. Goodness, thank you, Diana. It's, um, I think it, it, it never grows tired. Um, it's very warming to hear any personal experience about um, any type of mental health problem, and I think having both clinical and personal together is just so important so thank you I was scribbling a little bit while you were while you were speaking and I think the the message of hope is really important that comes out very clearly but also you gave some great practical examples of how you 
supported your recovery um, and I know we've spoken before that you call it reality testing and now I think it's often called ERP exposure and response prevention um, and you also mentioned about the balance of power and you um, reminded me of when I first started getting therapy I um, would have the, the jolt if you like of an obsession and the compulsion would happen instantly after and actually with therapy the gap between the obsession and the cult compulsion became bigger and then that's where I had space to decide right am I going to carry out the compulsion or am I going to go anti-OCD or so it was it's, it's um you know that's quite a few years ago but it's interesting to remember that it was that gap that was super important so an enormous thank you Okay, so the next session, um, next part of this session is the Q&A. Um, and we have had some submitted questions that we can discuss. And I can see that there are some live questions as well. Um, Chair's prerogative, I'm, I'm going to start with the submitted questions because you've touched on it already, Diana, and you, dis you described how you would know the difference between a normal level of anxiety and OCD. So thank you for, for preempting that, that, that question. And I just thought I'd put my view in, is that the way I would know um, is that if, the, if it was accompanied by familiar compulsions. So if something had happened and I would catch myself staring into space, thinking about, well, do I need to do this? And how do I approach that? Then I would be able to catch it and think, okay, that's an OCD response because if it's a normal level of anxiety i would go straight into a very practical you know the child's going to run across the road i would grab the child and pull them back so it was that that for me that's what, what, what that's how that felt um fiona did you want to share anything about your observations of how people know the difference between a normal level of anxiety and ocd yeah i mean it's a helpful reminder from what you said i think about anxiety being a normal emotion and quite a helpful emotion if your child is about to put their finger in a plug socket or whatever it is so we do we do need it um but of course it can become a, a disabling problem and there's no kind of you know there are diagnostic criteria etc but i think the, the thing for oneself to think about is uh is this getting in the way is this more than you know someone i in a similar situation would be doing or experiencing um and you know is, is the anxiety itself becoming a problem so you at a moment where you might feel less anxious and you can reflect on that experience so having you know trying to sort of think about it in those ways so it, it can be you know tricky when you're doing well with recovery and i think that's a question that sort of often comes up quite later it's like how do i recognize what's ocd and what's not um and of course there is no absolute line between things but it's kind of you know recognizing how it all works i think and thinking like you know i was uh, didn't you know someone that i respect who didn't have this problem would they be doing something similar and so on thank you fiona um and actually while, while you're speaking can you just check for me because what i thought we would do today see if um we can intertwine both submitted questions and also live questions Are there any live questions that you feel we could answer next and obviously just a reminder that you don't mention any names are all anonymized whatever you read out yeah, so if we go to the, the first of the submitted questions, I have a question here, how do you talk to your children about having an OCD diagnosis and how does that change as they grow older? So perhaps I'll leave that to you guys to answer that one. So Diana, can I ask you to kick off with an answer for that first and then I'll also give my view as well. So how we talk to our children about having OCD. <sighs> I think the first thing I would say is you have to do what feels comfortable and maybe you're at the stage in your life yet where it doesn't feel comfortable and perhaps the answer is just to wait until it does unless you absolutely have to tell them. I had to because I was doing a piece on television and I had to explain to them what was going on um, when they were very little. Um, but I, I think put yourself first and when the time feels right, do. I spoke to a psychiatrist about whether I should disclose my, uh, my OCD to my children. And I just obviously was, had to keep it very, very light. And I had um, anxiety about telling them. And he just said to me, 
one day your children will probably be very proud of being open and honest, but it doesn't mean you have to go there. Thank you, Dinah. Um, so I've got two uh, children, one um, top end of teens and one at the bottom end of teens. And it's interesting that with only five, six years difference, the approach was different because the world has changed. So with my eldest, um, it was quite formal and I, I took her out for a coffee and I said, I must just tell you something. And, you know, when I when you were born, my brain um, just needed a bit of help from a therapist. And I spoke quite in general terms um, and I told her about it. And I said, I've got videos if you want to watch it, but you ask me any questions um, and, and you're in control. Um, and if you fast forward a few years and then when I was speaking to my second child, there had been a real shift in school where mental health was spoken about so much more. It didn't need to be as formal as that. It just naturally came out. And in fact, from memory, they asked me, um, you know, oh, did you have any problems, mum, when you know when you had me? Um, and I said, actually, my brain did need some help. So it's quite interesting. I think that I agree with you, Diana. It has to be a personal decision, where, when, what you actually talk about with your children. But actually, and this is a good thing, the mental health education schools has improved enormously. And I noticed that in the last five years, I suspect we may have a way to go, but it's certainly more than it used to be. Um, so now it's far more fluid, certainly in this house, where we might talk about mental health, physical health. Um, and then once I discussed it with both, we'll be very differently. And that was quite general. Um, I then left it to them to ask me questions. I didn't force any information. Fiona, anything to add to that? I think those are great answers, really, because, yeah, there isn't one one way. It's going to depend on you, or depend on your kids, depend on their age and their stage and their individual personalities. And, um, yeah, absolutely. And there's no kind of musts or shoulds about it. Um, but, but sometimes, yeah, the level of detail, you know, it might be that, you know, mummy has, or daddy is, uh, you know, experiencing something at this moment and that can be helpful just to, so that they know it's not something to do with them and, and so on and there might be more detail obviously as you get older. Um, I would just add actually on reflection is um, say 20-30 years ago we wouldn't have had the introduction of social media so when you are talking if you if you choose to talk about something in the public arena it's always helpful to perhaps get someone else to read it and um, there's a term called future proofing so if you do have a young child and they will access that information when they're older read it with their eyes and see are you happy for them to hear you or, or read about it and if you are then go ahead and that's something that I do with my husband it was um we were very happy that whatever was out there that the children would see it or read it um but I would recommend that um yeah, that you future-proof what you put out in the public domain. Lovely. Thanks for reading that live question out, Fiona. Right, we'll go back to a submitted and we'll do it like that for a little while. Um, the next submitted was, why does OCD become worse in pregnancy for some women? Um, Fiona, from recollection, I think there's a slide about why it worsens, or is that my memory not serving me correctly? Yeah, that's right. So we've got, we've got some ideas, and that's actually a, it's a bit of a pregnancy theme, actually. So I think we're going to cover some of these submitted questions as the data on the likelihood of existing symptoms uh, worsening during pregnancy or after pregnancy. And then okay. some questions about treatment in pregnancy too. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I think we've got lots of reason to believe that it's a time of increased vulnerability to all sorts of uh, mental health issues because it's a complicated time with so much going on physically, mentally, role transitions, um, increased intrusive thoughts, increased messages about harm, uh, responsibility, appraisal is obviously really key to OCD obviously very key to pregnancy as well. So it's almost, you know, if you were going to make a recipe for kind of um, anxiety issues, you'd want to have a, a good element of threat, good element of responsibility, uh, uncertainty. So kind of, you know, obviously carrying a child, not knowing the outcome for, for many months and so on, or even years. So all of those things OCD can capitalize on. So that's the sort of baseline experience. So. Uh, that, that's all part of the theory, I think, as to as to why it's an increased time of risk. Thank you, Fiona. Um, and then the next submitted question is evidence, any, any evidence on long-term 
seem to me any evidence on long-term outcomes on babies of OCD in pregnancy? Um, we, no, we don't really have that uh, evidence in a really clear way, although uh, what we can say, I think, I mean, the first study I ever did was with mums with um, who had primary school age kids. And this is what actually got me interested in perinatal OCD because almost all of them, when I was asking them about their OCD said, oh yeah, but it actually did start during pregnancy and postnatally. And after like the fifth person had said this, I was like, oh, this is, sounds like a thing. Um, so having met them at this sort of later stage, so they hadn't had any treatment really of these mums because no, everyone was putting sort of two and two together. Um, the the main thing that came out from that study is that their kids were generally doing really well and there were some things that the mums I think had a greater perception of the, the difficulty really than that was evident in the kids so that was uh, I think and that's a, a message that we see across uh, the where we've got these studies that mums who have anxiety problems including OCD but not just OCD really worry a lot about the impact but there are not really sort of stark effects so uh i think we can sort of generally say you know anxiety tendencies to anxiety there's probably something genetic there so it's not specific to ocd but these things are only part of overall risks and there's certainly uh no kind of you know uh finality about that so that if you you know if you have ocd that your child will have ocd um and also because we have so much more now in the way of treatment these studies don't really speak to that. So if you, if you kind of get well, you're even less likely that these, you know, your your child will have the benefit of having a, a parent who is sensitive and really understands mental health. So possibly even a sort of protective factor. So we haven't got that data, but I, we can say that we also, there's no reason to think that if you have OCD, that your child will have lots of difficulties with OCD or anything else. Um, but I would say in all cases, you know, get treatment for yourself if you're worried about your child get treatment for them and so on these things are, are sort of common for all sorts of reasons i hope that answers the question adequately Thanks, fiona. um i do have a question for diana but i just wanted to ask um fiona if you've um if there are any other live questions that you feel would be helpful to answer at this yeah point? so there's a live question um could you say something about contamination fears during pregnancy and doing erp so actually uh yeah, treatment during pregnancy, fears and avoidance, um, excessive fears of uh, listeria, toxoplasmosis, toxins, chemicals, and harm being caused to the baby. So obviously doing ERP has to be done with the baby in mind as well. So yeah, the issue about doing treatment in pregnancy. Um, so I just have a quick <laughs> question. So um, I'm running, currently running a treatment trial, I should say full disclosure, about uh, doing exposure-based treatments in pregnancy because um, people sometimes, clinicians sometimes worry about this, but actually we it can go very well. Um, the, uh, there's no evidence that it's not safe to do that, but of course you would do it differently because as in any pregnant woman would do things differently from a non from the non pregnant self or uh, so on, so you would modify it um, to try and sort of get back into the normal range of what a pregnant woman would would do. So we probably would do a bit less of the old anti OCD experiments in pregnancy itself, but we'd want to obviously keep those for the postnatal period and really get sort of stuck in then. So it's definitely possible, and that's what we are doing in our trial, and people are doing very well um, with uh, ERP during pregnancy. I hope that answers your question there as well. But yeah, so thinking within the particular context of the person. Thanks, Fiona. Um, Diana, when you were speaking, um, you, you spoke about your um, uh, treatment, your therapy, and you were describing it as um, it was amazing, and you know you got a lot from it. I wondered whether you could just share a bit more about, you know, what you got from the treatment. Um. Yeah. Well, the reason why I described CBT as amazing was because it gave me the ability uh, and taught me what I had to do to nail this disorder. And in two days time, I would have been free of OCD for 20 years. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still free of it. So I still, 
uh, practice what I was taught, not just for just perhaps general anxiety, but just for for, for things with my with my children, or if I've got a situation where I'm a little bit fearful of, um, nothing to do with OCD. I just try and bring in some CBT. Might not be CBT, but I I, I do what I um, was taught, and it it does it does help. Um, it just it gave me the ability to um, to do things um, that perhaps I'd be fearful of doing um, in the past. Thanks, Diana. Um, we've got one more submitted question, but Fiona, is there anything else live? That, I'm conscious that people are in the session wanting to ask us questions, so I don't want to ignore those the, the asks. Yeah, absolutely. So there's uh, two questions that we haven't covered yet in the chat. So one is, how do you prepare yourself for having another child and protect yourself from an OCD relapse, for want of a better word? Um, can I can I just uh, share my view on that one? Um, so I've had three pregnancies, uh, two children, and um, I had to make myself an expert. Actually, I had to be very clear about what is OCD, how does it work, and what do I need? So Maria, and it'll be different depending on all of you individually. What do I need to help me um, maintain recovery and be well? Um, and it's making decisions that might feel counterintuitive. So, um, you know, there might be a lot, you might have family and friend members who want to see you all the time and they fill your weekend. Um, and we made a very practical decision that, um, this is always specific to me, that if I arranged something to do on a Saturday, I would make sure that I did do anything on a Sunday. So I had space just to be calm and breathe. I would, um, like you, Diana, I would, um, keep CBT very present in my life. So if I was going off to do something, I'd, I'd lean towards anti-OCD, even if I wasn't feeling anxious. So it became very, um, very normal. And one of the techniques I used when I was unwell and then continue using is imagining if I was in a situation where I would either expect an OCD thought to come in or an OCD thought would come in, I would imagine that I was someone else. So I'd be in a fine, I think of an OCD free mum. So I've got, I had a friend called Sue. She had children, she had animals, she was working. She just, you know, really um, captured what I wanted to, you know, who I wanted to be as a mum. And then if I was anywhere where I felt unsettled and anxious and had um, OCD thoughts come in, I would act as if I was Sue. Um, so even if it didn't feel right, I valued her decision making. So I knew I could trust that and I would act as if I was her and she was my OCD free mum go to. Um, and I found that incredibly helpful. So that's just a, a quick thought from me. Diana, any thoughts from you? Um, I kind of, you know, I can really um, yeah. add to that. Yeah. That's all right. I just want to make sure you had the floor if you needed, Fiona. Um, it's, yeah, one thing. Um, I mean, often people are, if they've had a really rough time, afraid of relapse in another pregnancy. But I always want to sort of remind people that, you know, you know a lot more now than you did at that time. So, it, you know, it's knowing your enemy with OCD very much and applying the things you were saying there. Um, and you won't go back to that position of not knowing what intrusive thoughts are not knowing kind of that they're not that they're normal and so on and all the things which OCD really scares people with in, in those initial stages so I think it's kind of I would encourage people not to let that be a factor in their decision making because mm -hmm. the circumstances are so different. Thank you. Anything else live that we need to cover? Yes there's one more on safeguarding. <laughs> How should maternity services respond to intrusions expressed from a safeguarding position? Safeguarding aren't specialists in perinatal mental health and therefore bound to act on parents' expressions of thoughts that they may harm their baby. What's your advice on how to avoid going down the route of referrals to social services for parents expressing these thoughts? I've been told by safeguarding we can't not act when a woman says she has images of harming her baby. Um, can I just quickly say one thing, then I'll hand over to you, Fiona, I think that's from a clinical um, ask, just to reassure people that there are now more specialist perinatal mental health services out there than ever before, um, so they have a very clear understanding of, of, of all sorts of disorders, and there's also now a new cohort of clinicians called perinatal mental health social workers that work with um, so, uh, with uh, specialist services, and they are very clear that a mum with OCD works away from the thought they're carrying out the 
compulsion for the for that obsession not to happen as opposed to working towards it so i just that's my understanding um and then just over to fiona or diana to to finish the answer i think fiona should take the floor here well i was mindful of what you're saying then about being cautious appropriately cautious about who you tell the details of your thoughts to um because there still is i mean this is a live issue we all know that there are still too many cases where this happens and it's misunderstood um, and a sort of a blanket policy is applied. Um, so all the work that you're doing is, is I think, helping with that. And these, you know, these developments are very positive. But um, yeah, I think I mean, I've certainly met women who've, you know, they've got a sense of when they've just sort of said, I'm having intrusive thoughts and they had already a sense that the person, the professional didn't quite get it. So they've just left it at that and, and they don't, need to know all the details of things so it's kind of if you're not happy with the responses ask for someone perhaps with more specialty so again it's finding out as much as you can from that point of view and we're doing everything we can to educate the professionals as well but I think if you know it's a can be a really tricky issue because if you're with people who don't understand and have this sort of blanket policy um then yeah, they need to get more advice. And I think David Veal's paper on risk assessment in OCD is really, really helpful. We publicize that as freely available on the KCL Pure system. And that that really talks about how unhelpful these risk assessments are. They could cause damage in themselves by kind of making people think that this is not OCD, which is kind of what OCD does itself. So um there, you know, we're doing what we can, I think, to raise awareness of this issue but I think kind of if you're not happy with where it's going ask for a more specialist assessment um, and find a person that you trust to, to disclose the, the thoughts to um, and the issues around it. Thanks Fiona. Now I'm conscious we only have a few minutes left. Um, I think there's one more submitted question. I'm just looking at it and wondering whether we've covered it or not. So my OCD has been triggered in pregnancy. Any tips to help dilute it? I've tried CPT work but it's not helping. I mean, I think all the things we've been saying, really, uh, CBT is uh, maybe not one thing. Um, it can sort of depend on your relationship with the, the therapist and so on. It is more tricky in pregnancy, I think, where, you know, the whole uh, context is very different. I say we can't kind of do our usual, let's just sort of smash it out of the park and do loads of anti-OCD stuff. You know, we are working with the reality of a slightly different threshold. But I think sort of keeping that in mind as possible all the tips that you've shared there Maria about kind of thinking about non-OCD mums and what they might be doing and and you know and I think doing your best with that obviously I'm a CBT person and I have seen it work in pregnancy um, but it doesn't work you know for everyone in every context in terms of kind of sometimes you just need to find the right person so I would say just keep keep going with that and kind of you know remember this is a time limited situation and sometimes it's about just doing your best through that but kind of don't give up on working on the OCD because you know you've got the, the postnatal period is a really good time to tackle it too. Thanks Fiona so I think Kathy's going to come on shortly to do an outro I think they've called it um, but just to finish um, Diana and I have put together some resources to support recovery from perinatal OCD and these slides we can put up um, live and there's all sorts of things from reading stories to watching people speak to listening to podcasts reading a book I know you said there are more available for Fiona but we've listed the one that you're the uh, lead author um, and just you know to share that it's you know there is hope and with, with the right treatment there is recovery that's that's possible um and then we've also just put some examples of signposting of support that i know kath you've covered also um before i hand over i just want to first of all give diana a, a moment to say thank you and then fiona and then myself so diana any any, any lasting um any, any final comments to say uh yeah, just to, to people listening just don't give up just keep going towards recovery and if there's a, re a relapse try and get back into, into therapy read up uh stick with people who are really supportive um and try and be with people who make you laugh as well when you're going through a tough time really important thanks diana fiona any any parting comments um 
just the same really thank you all for your uh, excellent questions and for being part of this and you know these resources are great you know peer support is just uh, amazing and that just didn't exist did it when we started off with this so yeah just keep going you get that thanks fiona and just on behalf of uh, fiona is the patron of maternal OCD and diana and i as co-founders just thank you all for being part of this session today um, and we hope it's been useful and an enormous thank you to OCD action for allowing us to have a session specifically looking at ocd during the perinatal period that's really important so an enormous thank you um, and then kath over to you